The Anno Domini. I guess not. I just didn't, didn't see it. Let's go home. Chapter 2 Don Juan Chapter 3 The House Divided 1. He remembered posters. He had bought them in a little shop in Kansas City and taped them to his bedroom wall. They had been there for a year before he tired of them, blown up photographs of the planet Earth, taken from close orbit and from behind the moon by Apollo astronauts. In his memory, Earth was all the shades of blue, frosted with masses and clots of white cloud. Even the land was blue, tinged with other colors, except where a rare red-brown patch of desert showed through. Jerome Branch Corbell, bald and wrinkled and very thin from his time in the cold sleep tank, hovered in black space in a contour couch, surrounded by an arc of lighted dials and gauges. Clouds and landscape raced past 300 miles below. It could have been Earth. Even the shapes of seas and continents seemed vaguely familiar. There was far too much reddish-brown in the mix, but after all, three million years. He tried his voice. It was husky, rusty with long sleep, and pitched too high. Is it Earth? I don't know, said Pirsa. Pirsa, that's silly. Is this the solar system, or isn't it? Try not to get excited, Corbell. I don't know if this is soul system. The data conflict. This is the system from which came messages. I followed them to their source. Let's hear these messages. Why didn't you wake me earlier, before we were committed? We were committed before I found the anomalies. I waited until we had achieved orbit before I woke you. I was afraid you might die of the shock. You can't tolerate another spell in cold sleep, Corbell. You would not live to reach another star. Corbell nodded. This last of his thawings was the worst yet. It was like waking with Asian flu and a brandy hangover. He felt sick and ugly. Less than ten years ago, by the evidence of his memory, the state had brought a young man to life. Ten years awake, plus a century and a half in cold sleep, had left of the young man a withered stack of bones. He had grown mortally afraid of senility, but his thoughts seemed clear. Let's deal with the messages, right. he said. What appeared on the womb room walls was not quite reality. Pierce controlled those images. Pierce projected Turn what his right. senses picked up from the world below. Now Pierce made a window appear in what had been deep space. Through the window, Corbell saw two translucent cubes slowly rotating. Within the cubes were shapes and figures formed in much tinier cubes, about a hundred per side. A laser was beamed at me while I was still thirty-two light-years distant from this star system, said Pirsa. There were two separate messages, two sequences of dots and gaps, each totaling one million thirty thousand three hundred and one bits each. One hundred and one cubed. One hundred and one is prime. There is some ambiguity, of course. I may have reversed left for right. It was not the best way to make pictures, but Corbell could recognize a man and a woman holding hands, the same figures in each cube. There were polygons of assorted sizes, in rows, and rough spheres. Pierce created a red arrow for a pointer. In your opinion, are these intended to represent human beings? Sure. He indicated the similar figures in the right-hand cube. And these? Yes. The arrow returned to the left-hand cube. This was the first message to arrive. These figures may represent atoms, carbon and hydrogen and oxygen. Go straight on. Do you agree? For all of me, they do. Why would they be there? They form the basis for protoplasmic chemistry. This bigger row, might it be a solar system? The large, nearly spherical hollow object would be the sun. The symbols inside may be four hydrogen atoms next to a helium atom. The row of smaller polygons would be planets. All right. Is it the solar system? Not unless the solar system has changed radically. What about this second cube? Why are these human figures different from the others? Corbell looked from one to the other. In the first message, the figures were solid. 
except for hollow bubbles to mark the lungs. The cubistic figures in the second group were hollow, and there was an X of Those small cubes running through them. I think I see. They're crossed out in that second message. And those rows of polygons look like eight off. more stellar systems, suns and planets, drawn smaller, some double suns. What message turn do you left. see? Eight star systems, two with double stars, crossed out hollow people. All right, read it this way. To whom it may concern, we are human, we fit the given model. Our chemistry is based on carbon and water. We come from a star system that looks like this. The similar people who come from these eight other systems look human, but they aren't. Except no substitutes. Does that sound right? I agree. Well, it's a very human thing to say. I could see your precious state sending a message like that, except... Except the state didn't have any natural enemies. Everyone belonged to the state. So this is the message you followed home? Yes. I felt that human beings must have sent it, and I was not sure of finding soul otherwise. How did they find us? Whoever sent that beam would have had to find us a couple of hundred light years out. We were still moving at near light speed, weren't we? The exhaust from a ramship would be most conspicuous to the right instruments. But the returning beam was very powerful. Sending it required strong motives. Corbell smiled in evil satisfaction. The strongest. Heresy. Your state came apart, Pierce. The colonies revolted. The state around Seoul must have wanted to warn any returning starships, don't stop at the colonies. The state was a water monopoly empire, as you told me. Such entities do not die by internal revolution. They die only by conquest by an outside force. Corbell laughed. He didn't like the sound. A high-pitched cackle. I'm not a history teacher, Pierce, you idiot. I'm an architect. It was a friend who told me about water control empires. And he is one of... He was one of these guys who say everything in absolutes because it gets more attention. I never knew how seriously to take him. But you believe him. Oh, a little. But what empire ever lasted 70,000 years? If you hadn't taken me so damn seriously, we'd have been home 2,930,000 years ago. Corbell was studying the pattern of the sun and planets in the left-hand cube. We're in a system that matches that picture? Yes. There was the sun, then three small objects, then a large object with a conspicuous lump on it, a large moon, then three medium-sized objects. The Earth isn't there. Otherwise, do you see the body now rising beyond this world's horizon? For a split second, Corbell thought it was the moon rising above the world's hazy edge. It was half full. It showed bigger than the moon. It glowed in white and orange-white bands along the lighted side. What should have been the dark side glowed just at red heat. Pierce said, This oxygen atmosphere world we circle is in orbit around that larger body. The primary is a massive gas giant, hotter than theory would account for. There are other anomalies in this system. We're in orbit about a moon of that thing? I said that, yes. Corbell's head whirled. All right, Pierce, show me. Pierce showed him, with diagrams and with photographs taken during Don Juan's fiery fall through the system. The sun was a young red giant, swollen and hot, of about one solar mass, but with a diameter of ten million kilometers. Pierce showed him the inner planet next to a map of Mercury. Granted, the two planets resembled each other, but this system's version was scarred and gouged in a different pattern. The second planet had considerably less atmosphere than Venus, but what there was included some oxygen. But it was the right size and in the right place. There was nothing in Earth's orbit. The third planet remarkably resembled Mars, but for the lack of moons and the great featureless mare marring one face. There are curious parallels all through the system, Pierce remarked. Corbell's reaction to these revelations was a slowly mounting anger. Had he come home, or hadn't he? Right. Curious. What about Earth? A moon much like the Earth circled this fourth planet, a world as massive as Jupiter, but far hotter than a world at this distance from its primary ought to be, even given the hotter sun. It was pouring out infrared radiation in enormous quantities, and more dangerous radiation, too. And the other moons? Their orbits would be funny anyway. 
that had been altered when the earth was moved into place, if that's earth. I thought of that, but I can find no moon of this world analogous to Ganymede, the biggest of the Jovian moons. All right, go on. Go straight on. The fifth planet was an unknown, an ice giant in a drunken skewed orbit that took it from just inside the Jovian's left. orbit almost out to the sixth planets. It was near the Jovian turn now, left. naked eye visible from Don Juan. Pierce showed him a close view of a marble banded in pale blues. Right. And then this turn. system may be much younger than Sol system, Pierce said. The skewed orbit of the fifth planet turn has not had right. time to become circular via tidal effects. The Jovian is hot because it only recently condensed from the planetary nebula. The star has not yet settled down to steady burning. What about this Earth-like world? Could it have evolved that fast? No, I didn't think so. And that third planet looked a lot like Mars, but not enough, damn it. Then observe the sixth. The sixth planet, well, it looked like this a target. Is where it ends. Don Juan had crossed nearly over the North Pole. Nestled within banded white rings was the fainter banding of an ice giant planet, in very pale blues and greens. The oval shadow of the planet lay across the rings, rendering the transparent inner ring invisible. The sharp-edged rift must be Cassini's divide, Corbell thought. He found other, lesser rifts, probably caused by tides from smaller moons. Saturn, he said. It resembles Saturn most remarkably. I went to some effort to take our course near this sixth planet. I tried to find discrepancies. That's Saturn. But nothing else matches my memory. Somebody's been mucking with the solar system. Three million years. A lot could have happened. The sun's soul could not have become a red giant in three million years. It is too young. Theory will not allow it. Theory does allow a similarity in the formation of planetary systems. That is Saturn. And that is Earth. Corbell, is it not possible that state citizens settled a moon of a Jovian world? Might they have recreated Saturn's rings for nostalgia and the love of beauty? You tell me. Is the love of beauty that powerful? It was a strange concept. It had its attractions, but... No, it doesn't hold up. They'd have put the rings around the Jovian for a better view. And why would they build another Mars? Why would the state Turn destroy left. the topography of Mercury? What removed two-thirds of the atmosphere of Venus and changed its chemistry? Uranus is missing. Ganymede is missing. A body bigger Turn than Mercury. Left. A gas giant more massive than Neptune orbits near the Sun in a skewed orbit. That hotter Sun could have burned away part of Venus's atmosphere. Mercury... Right. Hmm. And then turn right. What changed the Sun? How could the Earth have been moved at all? Turn Corbell... Right. I can't decide. There might have been agony in the computer's voice. Indecision was bad for men, but men Never could live mind. with it. A man's memories guy. could fade and grow blurred, but not Pearson's. Get ready to turn they moved the earth because the sun got too hot, Corbell speculated. What do you imagine? Did the state moor huge rocket motors at the North Pole and fuel them with Venus's atmosphere? The ocean would have flowed to cover the Northern Hemisphere. The Earth's surface would have ripped everywhere, exposing magma. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe they had something besides rockets. But that was Mars you showed me, and that's Saturn, and that's Earth. There. Couldn't that be the coast of Brazil? It does not match my memory. With evident reluctance, Pierce added, Go straight If other on. evidence were not considered, that shoreline could be the edge of the Brazilian continental shelf altered by the shifting of tectonic plates. The ocean must have dropped. Maybe some megatons of water vapor got left behind when they moved the Earth. The state could not have moved the Earth. There would have been no need, because Sol was not an incipient red giant. Computer, you can't go against your theories, can you? What if we were in the ergosphere of a black hole longer than we thought? We might have lost more than three million years. In tens of millions of years, could the sun be a red giant? Nonsense. We would never have found Sol at all. That was the last straw, because it was true. Corbell was an uncomfortably old man with a cold sleep hangover. All right, he said between his teeth. You win the argument. Now, for purposes of discussion, we are going to assume that that planet is Earth. At long last, we have come home to Earth. 
Now, how do I get down? It developed that Pirsa had that all figured out. Two. Corbell's pressure suit looked clean and new. It was form-fitting, with a bulging bulb of a helmet and a pointy-ended white spiral on the chest. He would not have been surprised to find it rotted with age. It had been waiting for nearly 200 years, ship's time. He went out the airlock with the suspicion that he was going to his death. He had never done this before, and in fact, the suit held up better than he did. Panting, perspiring, with his pulse thundering irregularly in his ears, he maneuvered himself at the end of a tether and turned for a look at Don Juan. The silver finish had dulled. Corbell winced at the sight of a gaping hole in one of the probes. Pierce had never mentioned a meteor strike. It could as easily have hit the life support system. Four of the probes were missing. The biological package probes were what made Don Juan a cedar ramship. Each of the probes held a spectrum of algae with which to seed the unbreathable, reducing atmosphere of some nearby Earth-like world, to turn the atmosphere into breathable air, and the world into a potential colony. Of course, they had never been used for that purpose. Deprived in detail of his civil rights, Corbell had stolen the ship and lit out for the galactic core. There had been ten probes mounted around Don Juan's waist. Now there were six. I ran the onboard hydrogen tank nearly empty, Pierce explained. I had to use four of the thrust systems in the probes to make orbit around Earth. Afterward, I put the probes in orbits as relay satellites. You will be able to call me from the surface wherever you are. Good. How do you feel? Can you survive a re-entry? Not yet. I'm out of shape. Give me a month. You'll have it. You'll have exercise, too. We must make ready one of the probes for your descent. I'm going down in one of those? They're designed to enter an atmosphere. Don Juan is not. I should have thought of that. I never did figure a safe way to get down. Aren't you coming down yourself? Not unless you so order. Small wonder if he sounded reluctant. It came to Corbell that Pierce's body was the ship. He would be a total paraplegic if he survived re-entry. Corbell said, Thomas Jefferson freed his slaves on his death. Can I do less? After I'm down, living or dead, Magnanimously, I free you from all orders, previous or subsequent. Thank you, Corbell. He had trained to work in a pressure suit, under orders from Pierce the Checker, but he'd been suspended in a magnetic field, not in actual freefall, and he had trained in a young body long ago. The work was hard. On the second day, he hurt everywhere. On the third, he was back at work. He would stop only when Pierce insisted. We won't try to build you a life support system, Pierce told him. We'll put what you need in the capsule with you and fill the capsule with plastic foam. Your suit will be your life support system. But emptying the probe warhead involved moving large masses and manhandling the bulky cutting laser for hours at a time. The algae tanks and the machinery that served them had to be removed in inspection hatch-sized pieces. Corbell dared not rip the hull. His life depended on its integrity. He needed long rest periods. He spent them in the womb room, watching films of Don Juan's entry into what Pierce now called, rightly or wrongly, the solar system. For a computer, Pierce had been starkly ingenious. Corbell would not have thought of using the package probes as thrusters. He would not have looked for Earth as a big new moon of what Pierce now called Jupiter, and Pierce nearly hadn't either. Pierce came that close to departing Sol with right. Corbell still in cold sleep to search nearby systems for remnants of the state. Corbell probably would have died en route. Apparently, the question of where they were no longer bothered Pierce. Finding it had only required way. Corbell's order to stop his worrying about it. But at the time, Corbell gathered, Pierce was frantic. He had used fuel he couldn't spare to make close flybys past Saturn and Mercury. Now, Corbell looked down at the Earth and yearned. All the mistakes I made. And still I got here. The mistakes all cancelled. If I hadn't turned the receiver back on, you couldn't have beamed your personality into the computer. I'd have wrecked the ship trying to run all the way at one gravity. If I'd been right about the galactic core, I'd have died of old age, that far from home. It's like something led me back here. Your records call you an agnostic. Yeah, Get I'm whistling in the dark. 
I keep thinking I'll just barely get killed landing. He was taking a long rest period in celebration. He had finally finished cleaning debris out of the probe warhead. With a meal in his hand, a layered sandwich baked like a cake, he watched the landscape roll below him. A dull red highlight gleamed on the nightside ocean below Jupiter. Where do I want to land? Is there any sign of civilization down there? There is evidence of the generation and use of power in three places. On the huge blue face of the planet, a green arrow Keep suddenly right. pointed at a green grid right. pattern. Here, and on the other side of the world, and in Antarctica. My orbit does not cover Antarctica, but I can land you there. No thanks. Isn't that just about California? Thinking, wait a minute, and then the west left. coast ought to bulge. And where's Baja, California? From what seemed to be turn central left. Mexico, the coast was a convex sweep all the way up to what must be Alaska. Most of what you called California and Baja, California, will be an island near the North Pole. I can land you there, too. No. Wherever someone is generating power, that's where I want to land. There, where you put the grid pattern, which looks a little like a city, doesn't it? Right angles. There are many clustered buildings, yes, but no strong evidence of pre-planning. Your era would have called it a city. I advise against your landing there. If they're the ones who sent the messages, they probably won't kill me. I serve their ancestral state. It might be Nevada, he thought, or Arizona. It was on the seacoast now. The differences between... Pierce stopped. Corbell got angry. That's Earth! Earth! The screwed-up solar system bothered him, too, when he let it. Pierce, right. that was Earth's plate right. tectonics you were describing. Did you find the island that used to be California? I found two islands that might have been California three million years ago. Well, then, did that happen by coincidence? No, Pierce lied. Call that area where you put the grid one city. Call the Antarctic area three city. Now, what about two city? Where is that? Bordering the Sea of Okhotsk in Russia. Land me in one city, then. More calmly, Corbell added, I must be nuts looking for civilization. Why do I want to spend my last days fighting a foreign language? But maybe I'll have time to find out what happened here. Corbell filled the probe nose cone with medicines, food, a tank of fresh water, tanks of oxygen. The plastic foam would hold them. He moored more solidly the ultrasonic whistle, controlled by signal from Pierce, that would melt the foam. He had put on muscle weight. The heart attack he feared and thought he was prepared for had never come. Don Juan's 22nd century medicines had given him that. But he lived with hot wires in his shoulders, tendinitis. At the last, braced in the middle of the ravaged nose compartment, with one hand on the spigot of the foam tank, he hesitated. Pierce, can you hear me? Yes. What will you do after I'm down? I will wait until I am sure you are dead. Then I will search other systems for the state. You're no crazier than I am. He wondered how long Pierce expected him to last, and didn't ask. He opened the spigot. Foam surrounded him and congealed. Thrust built up under his back, held for a time, then eased to almost nothing. Presently there was turbulence. It was a powered landing, not a meteoric re-entry. The thrust built up again, held, died. The probe rotated, and there was a jar that drove him two inches into the foam. Pierce spoke in his suit radio. May I consider myself free of your commands? Corbell suffered a quick, vividly detailed nightmare. Melt the foam first, he cried. But Pierce was no longer bound by his orders. Pierce would take vengeance on one whom the state considered a criminal and arch ingrate. The foam would not melt. Corbell would die here, embedded like a fly in amber, his freedom mere yards away. He felt a lurch, then another. The nightmare ended. He sank through melting foam, blind, to a solid bulkhead. The foam ran from his faceplate, and he saw that the inspection hatch was wide open. Corbell stepped into the opening and looked out and down. Pierce had landed the big cylinder on its side, on attitude jets. The sun, high overhead, was nonetheless a sunset sun, red and inflated. The land ran flat to a range of sharp-edged granite hills. It was all dead, 
browns and grays, dead rock and dust. Heat made the air shimmer like water. The state had not provided exit ladders for a package probe. Pierce had been clever again. The foam had run out the hatch and congealed into a foam plastic slope. Corbell walked down it, and his boots crunched, as on snow, partly thawed and refrozen. He stepped out onto the soil of earth. The soil had died. Three million years. Wars? Erosion? Loss of water? When earth fled inexplicably from an inexplicably expanding sun? At this moment he didn't care. He raised his hands to his faceplate. Do not try to take off your suit. Corbel, have you left the probe? Ready for his first breath of fresh air in a long time. Why not? Have you left the probe? Yeah. Good. For purposes of discussion, I have spoken of this world as Earth. Now I may speak of the differences. You have landed on a world marginally habitable at best, in a region uninhabitably hot. What? Corbell looked down. The outside temperature register was set at chin level, below the edge of his faceplate. It didn't look bad. Not bad at... Centigrade. The state used centigrade. Pierce said, It's too hot, Corbell. Temperatures in the equatorial zone range from 55 degrees centigrade upward. The oceans are above 50 degrees. I find little chlorophyll absorption in the oceans, and none on land, barring certain mountain valleys. You would have done better to land near one or the other pole. Somehow Corbell was not even shocked. Had he half expected this? My death is the end of the world. A very human attitude, and three million years after all. So that's what happened to the oceans. The atmosphere holds thousands of megatons of water vapor, enough to support the hypothesis that Earth's continental shelves have become dry land. What remains of the oceans should be very salty. Corbell, we still don't know. What about those mountain valleys? In a mountain range corresponding to Earth's Himalayas, there are valleys right. between one or two kilometers high. Some life has survived there. Corbell sighed. All right. Which way is civilization? Define civilization. One city. No, just point me at the closest place where someone is using power. 4.9 kilometers distant, there is minor usage of power. I doubt you will find people, or even living beings. The power level has not varied since we made orbit. I think you will find nothing but machines running automatically. I'll try anyway. Which way? West. I can locate you. I will guide you. 3. Corbell had not gone hiking in a long time. The suit was not uncomfortable. Most of his equipment's weight rested on his shoulders. The boots were not hiking boots, but they fit. He set out in a rhythmic stride, breathing the canned air, letting his attention rove the scenery, and had to stop very soon. He'd chosen too quick a pace. He rested then set out in a more leisurely stroll. It was level land, not ankle-breaking country, though he had to watch his footing. It was packed earth with rocks inset, and there were gentle wind-carved risings and fallings off. Pearsa led him to the range of hills, and apparently expected him to walk straight across them. Corbell turned left until he could find an easier slope. He found he was grumbling sub-vocally. He had had to grumble sub-vocally for, lo, these eight years' waking time in which he had grown 180 years old, while three million years passed on Earth. Grumble aloud, and you couldn't know what Pearson might pick up and take as an order. Goddamn literal computers, he grumbled. Sleep tanks and supermedicines that don't keep you young. Air and cooling equipment getting heavier with each step. Why couldn't they have put a belly band in this suit? A belly band was the greatest invention since the wheel. It let a hiker carry the weight on his hips instead of his back. If the state had had its head screwed on right, which was silly, the suit was designed for freefall and use aboard ship, not hiking. And if Pearsa took orders, it was a damn good thing. And he was lucky to be on Earth at all. And, Corbell thought as he topped the crest, he was damn glad to be here. Puffing, bent over so he could pant better half listening for the heart attack he'd been expecting for so long, it came to him that he was happy. Yeah, in three million years, probably no human being had ever done what he had done. Be nice if there was someone to brag to.
he saw the house. It was on a higher crest of hills beyond this one. Otherwise, he might not have noticed it. It was just the color of the hills, gray and dust brown. But he saw its regular shape against the blue of sky. It was set against the rock slope. It took him another two hours to reach it. He was being careful with himself. Even so, he knew how his legs would hurt tomorrow, if there was a tomorrow. He was two-thirds of the way up that second range of hills when he found the remains of a broken road. Then it was easier. The house was extravagantly designed. The roof was a convex triangle, almost horizontal, with the base against the hill itself. Below the roof were two walls of glass, or of something stronger. The house's single room was exposed to this single voyeur, who perched precariously on the slope and clutched at a boulder with thick gloves. It was, he thought, a hell of a place to build a house. He pressed his faceplate against the presumed glass. The floor was not level. Either the hill itself had settled, or architectural styles had changed more than Corbell was willing to believe. He was looking into a living room-sized area with what had to be a bed in the middle. But the bed was two or three times bigger than king size, and it had the asymmetrical shape of a 50-style Hollywood pool. The curved headboard was a control panel, fitted with screens and toggles and tall grills like hi-fi sound boxes, and a couple of slots big enough to deliver drinks or sandwiches. In the darkness above the bed hovered a big wire sculpture or mobile or possibly some kind of antenna. He couldn't tell which. Two pinpricks of yellow light lived in the control panel. This is your power source, all right, Corbell reported. I'm going to find the door. Twenty minutes later, he reported, There's no door. A house must have an opening. Look for an opening that doesn't look like a door. From your description, there must be more to the house than you can see. A toilet, at least. Perhaps an office or a food dispensary. They'd have to be under the hill. Hmm. All right, I'll keep looking. He found no trace of a trap door in the roof. Could the whole roof lift up in one piece on signal? Corbell couldn't guess whether the architect would have been that wasteful of power. If there was an entrance in the road itself, then hard dirt covered it. Corbell was getting annoyed. The house couldn't have been used in a hundred years, possibly a thousand, conceivably ten thousand. Likewise, the door wherever it might be. Maybe the house had a second lower story, now buried in the hill, door and all. I'll have to break in, he said. Wait, might the house be equipped with a burglar alarm? I'm not familiar with the design concepts that govern private dwellings. The state built our colleges. What if it does have a burglar alarm? I'm wearing a helmet. It'll block most of the sound. There might be more than bells. Let me attack the house with my message laser. Will it... Will it reach? Stupid. It was designed to reach across tens of light years. Go ahead. I have the house in view. Firing. Looking down on the triangular roof from his post on the roadway, Corbell saw no beam from the sky, but he saw a spot the size of a manhole cover turn red hot. A patch of earth below the house stirred uneasily, rested, stirred again. Then a ton or so of hillside rose up and spilled away, and a rusted metal object floated out on a whispering air cushion. It was the size of a dishwasher with a head, a basketball with an eye in it. The head rolled, and a scarlet beam the thickness of Corbell's arm pierced the clouds. Pierce, you're being attacked. Can you handle it? It can't hurt me. It could hurt you. I'd better destroy it. The metal object began to glow. It didn't like that. It fled away in a jerky, randomized path, while the red beam remained fixed on one point in the sky. Its upper body glowed bright red, verging on orange. It was screaming. Its frantic, warbling voice sang through Corbell's helmet. Suddenly, it tilted and arced away down the hill. It struck the plane hard, turned over and over, and lay quiet. There was a hole in the roof now. Corbell said, You think there are more of those? Insufficient data. Corbell climbed down to the roof and looked through. Molten concrete, or whatever, had set the bed afire. Corbell jumped down onto the flaming bedclothes, prepared to get off fast. Wrong again. It was a waterbed, and his feet went right through it. He waded out. 
then pushed the burning bedclothes into the puddle in the middle with his clumsy gloved hands. The fire went out, but the room filled with steam. I'm in the house, he reported. Pearson didn't bother to answer. Corbell the architect looked about him. This room, the visible part of the house, was a triangle. The bed in the center had the pleasing asymmetry of a puddle of water, and it was pleasing. An arc of sofa occupied one corner facing the bed. In front of the sofa was a slab of black slate, or a good imitation, arced like the sofa, but broken in the middle. Corbell bent and lifted one end of the slab, something on the underside, solid circuitry. At a guess, this had been a floating coffee table, until whatever was holding it up burned out. From inside the room, he still couldn't see any doors. There was only one opaque wall to inspect. He moved along it, rapping. It sounded hollow. Door controls on the headboard? Nuts. You'd have to walk clear around to the other side. Wait, there was something on the back side. Three thumb-sized circular depressions of chrome yellow against black headboard. Corbell pushed them. The back wall slid up in three unequal sections. The biggest one was a closet. Corbell found half a dozen garments in it, all one-piece long-sleeved garments with lots of pockets. Some had hoods. A layer of dust at the bottom of the closet was two to three inches thick. The second section was smaller, no bigger than a telephone booth, with a free-form chair in it. Corbell stepped in. He found another chrome-yellow depression on the wall and touched it. The door shot up behind him. A chair. Funny. Now he saw the great hole in the seat of the chair. A toilet? But there was no water in the bowl, and no toilet paper. Nothing but a glitteringly clean metal sponge attached to the chair by a wire. He left the cubicle. By any terms, it was pretty basic for a house with this complexity of design. The owner should have been able to afford something better. He turned to the clothing still hanging on shaped hangers. Funny, he couldn't tell if they were made for a man or a woman. He tugged at the fabric. It was amazingly resilient and very dusty. He tugged harder then tried in earnest to tear the cloth. It stood his full strength. This clothing seemed new, but the dust? Say there were temporary clothes, meant to be thrown out when styles changed, and clothes meant to last longer. How long? If that layer of dust was the temporary clothes... He still hadn't found a door. The third cubicle looked promising. There was nothing in it at all except for one unmarked switch, like the yellow circle in the bathroom, and a panel of four white glowing touch points. I think I found an elevator, he said. I'm going to try it. He used the yellow touch point. The door came up. He turned on his helmet lamp. Pierce said, Dangerous. What if the elevator takes you down and then breaks down? Then you beam me another manhole to climb out of. Corbell pushed the top button. Nothing happened. He'd expected that. He must be at the top. He pushed number two. Pierce's voice came unnecessarily loud. Corbell, answer if you can. Yeah? There had been no sense of motion, yet something had changed. There were eight more white glowing touch points, two additional vertical rows beside the first set closer together, and each of these was marked with a black squiggle. Corbell jabbed at the door button. Pierce said, You have changed position by 4.1 miles southwest and 200 feet loss of altitude. I place you in one city. Yeah. Corbell looked out into a different room. He was beginning to feel like a wandering ghost. Everything was spooky, unreal. He stepped out, around what once must have been a floating desk, but was now only knee-high. Screens and push-button panels set into the desk made it look like the control board in the womb room, but they were ruined. It must have rained here for hundreds of years. There was a rug like half-melted cotton candy, deep as his ankles. It squished beneath his boots and tore and stuck to his suit fabric. He stepped to the edge of an empty picture window frame and looked out and down. Thirty stories of windows and empty frames dropped away beneath his toes. He saw much taller buildings around him. There, to the right, a masonry behemoth had fallen, taking buildings and pieces of buildings with it. Beyond that gap, beyond the mist and rain, he thought he could trace a gray-on-gray -gray outline, a cube, impossibly large,
whose walls had a slight outward curve. Pearsa, did the state ever have any kind of instant transportation? Like a telephone booth? But you dial and you're there? No. Well, these people did. I should have guessed. Me, of all people. That house wasn't a house. It was only part of a house. I found the office. It's in the city. There ought to be a bathroom and a dining room and maybe a game room. God knows where. What we broke into was the bedroom. It's likely that the machinery has not been tended for a long time. Bear that in mind. Yeah. Corbell stepped back into the cubicle. Where next? He pushed the third down in the row of unmarked buttons. A light flared to life in the ceiling. The extra buttons had vanished. Corbell stepped out and smiled. Definitely, this was the bathroom. The outside temperature register at his chin was dropping. I think this place is air-conditioned, he said. You have traveled 3.1 miles west by southwest and have lost 600 feet of altitude. Okay. Corbell opened his faceplate. Just for a moment, he'd close it fast if... But the air was cool and fresh. It came to him, as he let the heavy backpack section fall, that he was exhausted. He pulled himself out of the rest of his armor and crouched at the edge of a bathtub, almost big enough to be called a pool. He couldn't read the markings on the water spigot. He turned it all the way in one direction and pushed it on. Hot water splashed into the tub. He turned it the other way. Boiling water spurted out, spitting steam. He recoiled. If he'd been in the tub... Okay, the cold water was hot, but it wasn't too hot to stand. It flooded out and around him as he lolled on the curved bottom. A tiny voice called, Corbell, answer. He reached and pulled the helmet to the edge. I'm taking a rest break. Check back in an hour, and send me a dancing girl. Four. A tiny voice peeped. Can, repeating, Corbell, answer if you can. Repeating, Corbell. Corbell opened his eyes. Every texture was strange to his sight and his touch. He was nowhere aboard Don Juan. Then where... Ah. He'd found two projections at the edge of the sunken tub, soft mounds like a pair of falsies, just right to rest his head between. His neck was still between the pillows. Lukewarm water enveloped him. He'd gone to sleep in the tub. If you can, repeat. Corbell pulled the pressure suit helmet to him. Here. Your hour's gone, and another hour and six minutes. Are you sick? No, just sleepy. Hang on. He pulled the spigot on. Hot water spurted through cool water and mixed. Corbell stirred with his foot. I'm still on a rest break. Anything new at your end? Something's watching me. I sense radar and gravity radiation. Gravity? Gravity waves going through my mass sensor, yes. I'm being probed by advanced instruments which must have learned a great deal about me. They could be automatic. They could also be from whoever sent the messages. Where is all this action coming from? From what would be Tasmania, if this were Earth. The probing has stopped. I can't detect the source. If it starts throwing missiles at you, you'll have to pull out fast. Yes. I'll have to change my orbit. I didn't want to use the fuel, but my orbit does not take me over Antarctica. Do that. Corbell stood up. His legs ached, and waded dripping from the warm water. A line of thick dust against the base of a wall might have been the remains of towels. He stopped before a picture window. The day had darkened. He looked down across a shallow slope of beach sand, downhill into haze that thickened to opaque mist. Was that a fish skeleton down there, glimmering white through haze? It looked far distant and big. Lightning flared, waited, flared again. The rain fell like an avalanche. Corbell turned away. He put on his undersuit, then his pressure suit, feeling the weight and the chafe spots. The bath had been good. He would have to come back here when he got the chance. There was even a sauna. Not that he'd need... Yeah... A sauna? This place was old. If it had been built after the earth grew hot, the sauna would have been a door to the outside. He stood in the booth, dithered, and decided not to push the bottom button. Persa was right. The machinery had been untended for a long time. So, bedroom or office? 
He knew those circuits still worked. Bedroom. He stepped out. Next to his chin, the temperature readout rose in blinking numerals. He stepped around to the headboard, confirmed a memory. He had seen a television screen and controls. He turned it on. The screen lit, first gray-white, then... It was a fuzzy view of the ruined bed, showing his own armored legs. He tried switches until he found the playback. The scene ran backward. Suddenly, the bed was whole, and four figures writhed on it at flickering speed. The scene jumped to a different foursome, or to the same foursome differently dressed, before he found a way to freeze it. Corbell, I have tried to signal the source of the probes, to no effect. Okay. Listen, if you have to run, just do it. We'll both be safer if you don't stop to call me about it. What will you do now? I'm watching home movies, Corbell chortled. This place is like the Playboy Mansion. There's an invisible video camera focused on the bed. A degenerate civilization, then. Small wonder that they could not save themselves. You should not degrade yourself by watching. What are you... What about the loving bunks in the dormitory in Sealerdor? Keep left. That wasn't degenerate? It was not thought polite to watch the loving bunks. Corbell swallowed his annoyance. I want to know if they're still human. Are they? The tapes faded, and they're wearing clothes, loose suits with lots of openings in them, in pastels. If they aren't human, I can't see the differences. But they're thin, and they don't seem to carry themselves right. He paused to watch. And they're very limber. The situation isn't quite what I thought. Keep left. In what way? I thought it was an orgy for four. It isn't. It's like in ancient China. Two of them are servants. They're helping the other pair get into those advanced sexual positions. Maybe they're not servants. Maybe they're trainers or teachers. He watched some more. Or even... They're as limber as dancers. Maybe that's what they are. I wish I had a view of the couch. There might be spectators. Corbell. Yeah? Are you hungry? Yeah. I may have to use that fourth button. I wouldn't bother. If a thousand-year-old kitchen is your only food source, you'll die quickly. Your suit will only recycle air for another seventy-one hours. Your food syrup reserve is trivial. I suggest you try to reach the South Pole. I am over it now. I see a large continental mass and forest. Well, fine. Corbell switched off the stag movie and made for the booth. The second button down created a panel of eight buttons beside the smaller panel. He studied it. The symbols on those eight buttons might be letters or numbers. He reached, then drew back. I'm afraid of it. Of what? Of this panel in the office. See, there are four white buttons in all the booths. I think that's an intercom, a closed circuit. You couldn't get into it except from the office, or by breaking in the way we did. But there are eight buttons with squiggles on them here in the office. I think they must be more like a telephone dial. And there's a private number that lets you into the office. Reasonable. Well, what happens when you dial a phone number at random? In my time, there was a recorded voice to tell you you had made a mistake. Yeah, we had that too. But in this instant transportation setup, you might be sent nowhere. Poof. That would be poor design. Can you find a telephone directory? There was nothing like that in the booth. Corbell opened the door. Rain and howling wind were blowing into the office. Fat drops plated themselves across his faceplate. He walked around the desk, waited a minute for the water to run off the glass, then began pulling at desk drawers. Keep they right didn't want to open. He pried one open and found it half full of gray-green mold. An abandoned apple? Machines right. were set into the desktop. Telephone, picture phone, computer link. What? No telling now. Time and rain had destroyed them. I'll have to try pushing buttons at random, he told Pearsa. Good luck. Why did you say that? To be polite. Corbell examined the array of eight buttons by the light from his helmet. The booth could kill him so fast he'd never know it. Punch at random? He could do no better than that. He chose a button, the fifth, counting across and down whose symbol looked like an upside-down L.A. gallows. He pushed it once, pause, Go twice, on. pause, thrice. Four did it. 
Suddenly, there was indirect lighting around the rim of the ceiling. The door wouldn't open. Annoyed, he chose another button, an hourglass on its side, and compressed from both ends. Four, 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 four. You have changed position twice, Pierce informed him. This time, the door opened. There were disintegrating skeletons in identical uniforms? Loose garments, short pants, sleeveless shirts with rolls of fabric at the shoulders. Under the dust, the garments looked new, in bright scarlet with black markings. The bones inside were crumbled with age, but they could not have been big men, five feet tall or thereabouts. Corbell moved among them, looking for bullet wounds. No holes in the garments or the skulls, but from the way they sprawled, they seemed to have died in a firefight, and they seemed to be human. He found desks at what looked like computer terminals, a thick sliding door had been melted out of the wall. Beyond it were cells. Their gridwork doors were decoratively lacy and different on each cell, but they were locked, and there were more skeletons in the cells. Police station, he reported to Pierce. I was trying for a restaurant. I pushed the same button four times. He heard irritation in his voice. Getting tired? See, what I didn't want was a number that went nowhere. The numbers the restaurants fight for are the ones that are easiest to remember. At least they used to be. The state restricts those numbers to important municipal functions, police stations, hospitals, ombudsmen. Corbell stepped through another, larger, melted door. Doors beyond retracted before him, and he stepped into a waterfall of rain. He finally made it outside. He couldn't okay. see much. Let's a city a street, route. and occasional heaps of clothing Reroute. peeking through the mud. Skimpy one-piece shorts and undershirt garments Finding in every pattern route. and color, Blind. save scarlet. I'll, find a new route. I'll have to try the other okay. repeating numbers, Let's find he said a new without route. moving. I think it is safe. If you find a number not in use, you will not go nowhere. You're willing to risk that, huh? He still hadn't moved. The rain ran down his faceplate and drummed on his helmet. There is an alternative. I have probed the city with my senses. There is hollow space, a system of tunnels underground, leading away in many directions. I can lead you to the underground space where they converge. What's the point of... You think it's a subway system? They'd have stopped using it when they invented the booths. If they no longer use the subway cars, they may have kept the buildings as a transportation nexus. Economy. Five. He walked through pelting rain on packed dirt covered by thin mud. It sucked at his boots. He couldn't afford the energy that cost him. He was already too tired. The streets and buildings were largely intact. He found no more scenes of mass death. There was a bubble, half glass and half metal, like a Christmas tree ornament, twelve feet across. It had smashed against the side of a building and was half full of rainwater. Corbell looked inside. He found spongy upholstery and a pair of seats. One was occupied. Mud with lumps of bone in it oozed from within a yellow shorts and undershirt garment. Corbell forced himself to search the big patch pockets. What he found, he stowed in his tool pouch. He could examine it later. He walked on. Later, there was an intact bubble, abandoned. It looked intact. The bright work in the interior gleamed. He tried to start it, but nothing he tried seemed to work. He gave up and went on. Now there was a tremendous empty lot to one side, with wind-weathered stumps of trees and traces of curving paths. A park? To his other side was a wall that went up and up, curving away from view. It curved away from before and behind him, too, so that he had no idea how high it was or how wide. In the mist beyond the office picture window, he had thought to trace the outlines of a cube bigger than belief. So, it had been real. Streets. Why streets and cars? Corbell began to suspect what he would find at the transportation nexus. You are over the hollow space, said Pierce. That's good. I'm tired. Corbell looked around him. Mummified park to the left, wall to the right. Ahead, the wall turned to glass. An entire wall of glass doors. He pushed through into gloom lit by his helmet lamp. The ceiling gave no sense of distance only of random colors that changed with his position. The place was wide. His beam got lost in it. 
He glanced down at another confusing light, the glow of dials at his chin. The temperature was down to 20 degrees centigrade. Air-conditioned, he said. Good. Your suit batteries will last longer. There could be anything in this place, he argued with himself. He opened his faceplate. No heat. Sniffed. A touch of staleness, that was all. I've got to get out of this suit. I'm tired. Drink from the syrup, nipple. He laughed. He'd forgotten it was there. He sucked until his belly felt less empty. Purser was right. Half of his tiredness had been hunger. He pulled himself out of the rest of the suit. Stepping into the rug was a sudden, thrilling shock. It might be the same as the rotted rug in the office, but it was dry, intact, and ankle-deep, like walking on a cloud. It felt damned expensive, but there must have been an acre of it here in the foyer of a public building. Going to sleep, he told the helmet. He sprawled out in the cloud of carpet and let it close around him. Six. Gray dawn. He wriggled a little in the luxury of the rug. The ceiling was thousands of shades of color and what seemed to be whorl patterns. You could go crazy staring into it and never know how far away it was. He closed his eyes and dozed again. Came down to die, he thought. He said, Pierce, how do you expect me to die? Heart attack? No answer. The helmet was out there by his fingertips. He pulled it close and repeated the question. I think not, said Pierce. Why? The state's wonderful medicines? Yes, if one counts contraceptives as medicines. After the founding of the state, there was a generation in which no man or woman subject to inherited diseases might have children. The population fell by half. Famine ended. Heart patients? His father had died of a coronary. Certainly the children of heart patients were not allowed to have children. Your genes are those of a criminal, but a healthy one. You arrogant sons of bitches. What about my children? Their father was cancer prone. So they'd edited Corbell's genes right. from the human race, and it was three million years too late to do anything about it. Corbell got up stretched against Exit stiff right. muscles, and looked about him. There were rings of couches around freely curved tables that still floated. The couches looked like humps in the rug. Nuts, said Corbell. I could have slept on a couch. He pushed down on a floating table, finally putting his full weight on both hands. He'd lowered the table an inch. When he released it, it bobbed up again. Set within one wall was a row of booths. Corbell went to examine them. The rug stuff flowed delightfully around his toes. In each booth were rows of push buttons marked with squiggles. A dozen buttons with the eight marks he'd seen already and four new ones. He pushed a button larger than the others. Operator? And got no response. Then he noticed the slot. From the tool pouch of his empty pressure suit, he spilled the items he had stolen from a smashed car. A seamless silver lipstick did nothing for him. Handkerchief. Faint colors seemed to swirl in the material. Candy wrapper. The hard candy must have melted in untold years of rain. Or it could have been drugs or medicine. Or he could be wrong on every point. A hand-sized disc of clear plastic. Its rim, also plastic, embedded with green ornamental squiggles. That looked about right. Which way was up? He tried it in one of the booths. It wouldn't fit in the slot with the markings up. With the markings on. down, it did. He pushed the larger button, and the screen lit up. Now what? The screens might be the phone books he needed. All he had to do was punch for information without reaching a non-existent number and read the answer in squiggles. Corbell was sweating. He hadn't thought this out. He lowered his hands and stepped out of the booth. Well, no hurry. His two days plus air reserve was not being used. There was time to explore. And there, far at the back of the lobby, were the stairs he'd expected. Broad, well-designed by the principles he had learned in his first life, carpeted in cloud rug. A flight of stairs going down into darkness. He went back to tuck his helmet in the crook of his elbow and to retrieve the lens-shaped key credit card. Then he started down the stairs, playing his helmet lamp ahead of him, humming. With her head tucked underneath her arm, she walks the bloody tower. The stairs unexpectedly lurched into motion, throwing him backwards. He sat up, cursing. He hadn't hurt himself, but 
get crippled here and it would be his death. Light grew below him. At first he thought this was the last gasp of an emergency power system. The light blossomed. When he reached bottom, it was bright as daylight. He was in a vast open space with a high ceiling and alcoves he thought were shops, a place with the feel of a European train station, but with touches of sybaritic luxury more appropriate to a palace. Keep there were right. fountains and more of the ankle-enveloping rug swelling to rings of couches along one entire wall. Here's a... I found a map. Please describe it. It's two polar projections. Damn, I wish I could show you. The continents are about the way they were when I was in school. These maps must have been made before all that ocean water evaporated. There are lines across them, all from... He checked. This point, I think. Most of the lines are dark. Persa, the only lines still lighted run to Antarctica and the tip of Argentina and uh, Alaska. Alaska had been twisted north. So had the tip of Siberia. The lines run right through oceans, or under them. He saw that what he'd taken for shops were alcoves with couches and food dispensing walls. He tried one. When he inserted the plastic disc, a woman's voice spoke in tones of regret. He tried other slots and got the same reedy voice repeating the same incomprehensible words. Next stop? Down there at the far end, that line of doors. Thick doors with slots for credit discs. He went back for his pressure suit. The stairs carried him up. How the heck did they handle streams of commuters going both ways? He rode back down with a heavy suit draped over his shoulder. There were lighted squiggles on the map, next to the lighted lines. He memorized the pattern that marked the route he wanted, not to the center of the thawed Antarctic continent, but to the nearer shore. Shores get colonized first. The doors. Yes, there was the pattern of squiggles he wanted. The disc, he found it, turned it blank side up, and inserted it. The door opened. He retrieved the disc, glanced at it, he and left, smiled. And the squiggles had changed. Back. He'd been docked the price of a ticket. He faced glass within glass within concrete. The end of the subway turn car left. protruded slightly from its socket in the wall. It was a circle of glass eight feet across, with an oval glass door in it. Through the glass, Corbell saw a cylindrical car lined with seats facing each other and padded in cloud rug. The front Go of the car on. was metal. He found a disc-sized slot in the glass door. Right. He used it. The door opened. He entered and pulled the disc out of the other side. The door closed. Here I am, he said into the helmet. Where? In one of the subway cars. I don't know what to do next. Wait, I guess. You aren't going to use the instant transportation booths? No, I think that was a dead end. Maybe they were toys for the rich, too expensive to be practical, or too short range. Why else would there be streets with cars on them? The streets were too good, and there were too many cars. I wondered, Pierce said. Four digits in base eight gives only 4,096 possible booth numbers. Too few. Yeah. There was room for about eight people, he decided on benches of cloud rug, tinted at intervals and contrasting pastels to mark off the seats. He found another food dispenser, which spoke to him regretfully when he tried it. Behind a half door that would barely hide one's torso, he found a toilet, again equipped with one of the glitteringly clean metal sponges. He tried that, too. His best guess was that the sponge had an instant elsewhere unit in it. It cleaned itself miraculously. There were arms for the benches, they had to be pulled out of a slot along the back and locked. There is increased power usage from your locus, said Pierce. Then something's happening. Corbell stretched out on the cloud rug bench to wait. No telling about departure time. He would wait 24 hours oh, before on. he gave up. His stomach growled. Chapter 4 The Norn 1. Somebody spoke to him. Corbell jerked violently and woke with a scream on his lips. Who but Pierce could speak to him here? But he was not aboard Don Juan. The voice had stopped. Pierce spoke from his helmet. I do not recognize the language. Did you expect to? Play it again for me. He listened to Pierce's recording of a boyish voice speaking in reassuring, liquid tones. Afterward, he sighed. 
If that guy was waiting to meet me himself, what could I tell him? What could he tell me? I'll probably be dead before I can learn his language. Your story has wrung my heart. Most of your contemporaries only had one life to live. Yeah. Your self-centered viewpoint has always bothered me. If you could see yourself as... No, wait a minute. You're right. You're dead right. I've had more than most men are given. More than most men can steal, for that matter. I'm going to stop bitching. Get ready you amaze me. Will you now dedicate your services to the state? What state? The state's dead. My self-centeredness is as human as your fanaticism. The stranger's voice spoke again, in beautiful, incomprehensible words, and Corbell saw him. His face was beyond the car's forward wall, beyond the metal, as if the metal were transparent. Straight on. A hologram? Corbell leaned forward. It was the bust of a boy, fading below the shoulders. He was twelve or so, Corbell guessed, but he had the poise of an adult. His skin was golden. His features were a blend of races, black, yellow, white, and something else, a mutation perhaps, that left him half bald. He had only a fringe of tightly curled black hair around the base of the skull and over the ears, and an isolated tuft above the forehead. The face smiled reassuringly and vanished. The car shot forward and down. Corbell was on a roller coaster. He pulled out a chair arm and hung on. The car fell at a slant for what felt like half a minute. Then there was high gravity as car and tunnel curved back to horizontal. Light inside, darkness outside. Corbell was beginning to relax when the car rolled, surged to the left, rolled, surged to the right, steadied. What was that? Changing tunnels? His ears popped. Pierce spoke. Your speed is in excess of 800 kilometers per hour, and still accelerating. A remarkable achievement. How do they do it? At a guess, you are riding a gravity-assisted linear accelerator through an evacuated tunnel. You are about to pass beneath the Pacific Ocean. Can you still hear me? Barely. Corbell, answer if you can. Corbell, answer... Pierce's voice faded completely. Pierce! Nothing. Corbell's ears and sinuses felt pressure. He worked his jaw. There was no reason to panic, he told himself. Pearson would pick him up when he reached Antarctica. The hissing sound of motion was sleep-inducing. Corbell was tempted to lie down, preferably with his feet forward, because there would be deceleration at the end. To sleep, right. perchance to and dream. Right. What kind of dreams does the last man on Earth have while traveling beneath the Pacific Ocean at Mach one and a half, Turn in a right. subway system that hadn't been repaired in hundreds of years. He could be stopped beneath the Pacific, to suffocate slowly, while an almost human ghost reassured him that service would be resumed as soon as possible. Pierce could wait forever for him to emerge. Too much imagination and I'll scare myself to death. Too little and I'll get myself killed. Corbell worked his jaw to relieve pressure in his ears. Had Pierce said, evacuated? He poked his head into the helmet to see the dials. Air pressure was down and still dropping. He panted as he worked his way into the pressure suit. Vacuum tunnel, right, he gasped. Stupid, stupid, the car leaks. Right. And what and else had deteriorated right. in this ancient system of tunnels? But now the ride was superlatively smooth. Right. Presently, Corbell emptied his bladder, then emptied his suit's bladder into the toilet. The urine ran boiling through the bowl without leaving a trace. A frictionless surface. Hours passed. He dozed sitting up, woke, lay down on his face, didn't like that, lay down on his back with the backpack a bulge under his shoulders and a chair arm under his head. Better. He slept. A surge woke him. He sat up. He sucked syrup, sucked the last of it, and it was almost enough. He felt acceleration. Was he going uphill? Half a minute of low gravity, a final surge backward. He felt himself at rest. There was an almost subsonic thump beyond the metal end of the car. The glass door and the metal door beyond it both popped open at the same time. Corbell had just stood up when the thunderclap slapped him backward. Sometimes you would end a long backpacking trip with aches in every muscle, 
and a mind void of everything except the determination to keep walking no matter what. In much the same frame of mind, Corbell got to his feet and limped toward the doors. His ears rang. His head hurt where he'd bumped it on his helmet. He twisted his back. He felt stupid. The thunderclap of air slamming into vacuum should not have surprised him. Pearson, he called. This is Corbell for himself. Answer if you can. Nothing. Keep right Where the hell was Pearson? Right. There was nothing blocking him now, was there? Corbell shook his head. All he could do turn was keep right. wading through the surprises until they stopped him. Never there were dim lights far back in a great open space. He picked out couches and alcoves and the faintly glowing lines of a wall right. map. Numbers at his chin showed pressure normal or a bit higher. Temperature turn warm left. but bearable. He opened his faceplate. The air was warm and musty. He smelled dry rot. He lifted his helmet, sniffed again. Go straight on. A trace of animal smell. Meep. He jumped, then relaxed. Where had he heard such a sound? It was friendly and familiar. Motion caught at his eye. Left. Me. The beast came questing through dusty cloud rug. It was a snake, a fat furred snake. It came toward him in an S-shaped flow. Its fur was patterned in black and gray and white. It stopped and lifted its beautiful cat's face and asked again, like a cat, Meep. I'll be damned, said Corbell. Something rustled behind him. He forgot the furred snake. He was sleepy, so sleepy that in a moment he knew he would pass out. But there were furtive sounds behind him, and he turned, fighting to stay on his feet. Under a hooded robe of white cloth, with a touch of iridescence in it, a bent human form. While the cat snake distracted him, she had struck. He saw her in shadow, tall and stooped, gaunt, her face all wrinkles, her nose hooked, her eyes deep set and malevolent in the shadow of the hood. Her swollen hands held a silver cane aimed at Corbell's eyes. He saw her for a bare moment while the numbness closed over him. He guessed he was seeing his death. Two. Finding a new route. He was on his back on a form-fitting surface, his legs Make apart, his arms above his head. The air was wet and heavy and hot. Sweat ran in his crotch and armpits and at the corners of his eyes. When he tried to move, the surface surged and rippled, and soft bonds right. tightened round his wrists and ankles. His pressure suit was gone. He wore only his one-piece undersuit on a world uninhabitably hot. He felt naked and trapped. Light pressed on his eyelids. He opened them. He was on a waterbed, looking at gray sky through the jagged edges of a broken roof. He turned his head and saw more of a bedroom. Curved headboard with elaborate controls. Arc of couch with floating coffee table to match. These bedrooms must have been mass-produced, like prefab houses. But a tornado had hit this one. The roof and the picture windows had exploded outward. The old woman was watching him from the arc of sofa. He thought, Norn, fate in the shape of an old woman. She was vivid in his memory, and so was the silver cane in her hand. He watched her stand and come toward him, and the fur boa round her shoulders raised a prick-eared head and watched him back. It was curled one and a half times around her neck. The tip of its tail twitched. Damn it, that was a cat. He remembered a cat like that, lion, though he'd forgotten the boyhood friend who owned it. Lots of luxurious fur and a long, rich, fluffy tail. If lion's tail had been multiplied by three and attached to lion's head, this beast would have been the result. But how could evolution cost a cat its legs? He didn't believe it. Easier to believe that someone had tampered with a cat's genes sometime in these last three million years. The woman stood over him now, her cane pointed between his eyes. She spoke. He shook his head. The bed rippled. Her hand tightened on the cane. He saw no trigger, but she must have pulled the trigger because Corbell went into agony. It wasn't physical, this agony. It was sorrow and helpless rage and guilt. He wanted to die. Stop, he cried. Stop! Communication had begun. Her name was Mirali Lyra Zilashishthar. 
She must have had a computer somewhere. The box she set on the headboard was too small to be more than an extension of it. As Corbell talked, meaninglessly at first, babbling merely to stop her from using the cane, the box functioned as a translator. They traded nouns. Merely Lyra pointed at things and named them. Corbell gave them his own names. He had no names for many of the things in the room. Cattail, he called the Furred Snake. Phone booth, he called the Instant Elsewhere booth. She set up a screen, a television that unrolled like a poster. Another computer link, he guessed. She showed him pictures. Their vocabularies increased. Give me food, he said when his hunger had grown more than his fear. When she understood, finally, she set a plate beside him and freed one of his hands. Under her watchful eye and the threat of her cane, he ate and belched and communicated. More! She took the plate behind the headboard. A minute or so later, she brought it back reloaded, with fruit and a slice of roasted meat, hot and freshly cut, and a steamed yellow root that tasted like a cross between squash and carrot. As he shoveled down the first plateful of food, he had hardly noticed what he was eating. Now he found time to wonder, where did she cook it? And to guess that she used the phone booth to reach her stove. The cattail dropped from the old woman's shoulder onto the bed. Corbell froze. It wriggled across the bed and sniffed at the meat. Mirelli Lyra thumped it on the chest, and it desisted. Now it crawled up onto Corbell's chest, reared and looked him in the eyes. Corbell scratched it behind the ears, its eyes half closed, and it purred loudly. Its belly was hard leather, ridged like a snake's, but its fur felt as luxurious as it looked. He finished his second helping, feeding some of the meat to the cattail. He dozed off, wondering if Mirali Lyra would shake him awake. She didn't. When he woke, the sky was black, and she had turned on the lights. His free hand was bound again. His pressure suit was nowhere in sight. Even if she freed him, she would still have the cane. He didn't know if the phone booth worked. At the back of his mind, he wondered if Pierce, thinking him dead, had gone on to another star. What did she want with him? They worked on verbs, then on descriptive terms. Her language was of no form he had ever heard about, but the screen and mechanical memory made it easy for them. Soon they were trading information. Take off the ropes. Let me walk. No. Why? I am old. So am I, said Corbell. I want to be young. He couldn't read expression in her voice, but the way she'd said that jerked his head up to look at her. So do I. She shot him with the cane. Guilt, fear, remorse, death wish. He cried and writhed and pulled at his bonds for eternal seconds before she turned it off. Then he lay staring at her in shock and hurt. Her face worked demonically. Abruptly, she turned her back on him. His thrashings had frightened the cattail. It had fled. I want to be young. And blam! And now her back was rigid and her fists clenched. Did she hide red rage or tears? Why? Is it my fault she's old? One thing was clear. She was keeping him tied up for her protection and his own. If she used the cane on him when his hands were free, he might kill himself. The cattail crawled back onto his chest, coiled, and reached to rub noses with him. Me? It demanded an explanation. I don't know, he told the beast, now rumbling like a motor on his chest. I don't guess I'll like the answer. But he was wrong. She freed one of his hands and fed him. It was more of the same. Two fruits, a steamed root, roasted meat. She fed the cattail while she was at it. The fruit was fresh. The meat was like overdone roast beef sliced moments ago. She had been out of sight behind the headboard for no more than a minute. Even a microwave oven wasn't that fast, or hadn't been in 1970. It stuck in his mind. And he had to go to the bathroom. She was irritatingly, embarrassingly slow to understand. He knew she had the idea when she began to pace, scowling, dithering as to whether to leave him in his own filth. Eventually she freed him, first from behind the headboard, his wrists, then his feet. She stood well back, covering him with the cane, while he went into the middle closet. 
Alone at last, with the door blocking her eyes, he let out a shuddering sigh. He wouldn't try to escape, not this time. He knew too little. It wasn't worth the risk that she wouldn't let him go to the bathroom again. Keep it wasn't worth the risk of the cane. The cane. It had reduced him to a groveling slave, instantly, twice. He had never even considered keeping his dignity. In that, the cane lost half its power. He could feel no shame. Still, he knew that too many applications of the cane would leave him nothing like a man. He was a shell of a man reanimated by electrical currents and injections of memory RNA. Keep he had been changed again and again, but whatever he was, he was still a man. What the cane might do to him was cruder, more damaging. He would cooperate. But she was mad. Even if sane by the standards of her time, unlikely, by Corbell's, she was mad and dangerous. Old and feeble as he was, he would have to escape before she killed him. The phone booth must be working. He'd seen no microwave oven here in the bedroom. Good. Calling Pierce would have to wait. He dared not ask after his pressure suit. It might show that he was thinking dangerous thoughts. And even if Pierce were still in the solar system, how could he help? Corbell left the booth and returned to his spread-eagled position on the bed. Merely Lyra moored his hands from behind the headboard, then his ankles. They resumed their conversation. The translator skipped words. He missed some of it before he realized what he was hearing. Then he asked questions, got her to back up for the blank spots. He heard it in bits and pieces. She was Merely Lyra Zilashishthar, a citizen of the state. The state? He wondered about that, but she described it in much the way Pierce did, except that her state had been the government of all known worlds for 50,000 years, Corbell's years, for the earth had not yet been moved. In her youth, she had been supernaturally beautiful. Corbell tactfully did not question this. Men went incomprehensibly mad over her. She never understood the force that drove men to such irrationality, but she used her sex and her beauty as she used her mind for advancement. She was born hyperactive and ambitious. By the age of twenty, she was high in the ranks of intrasystem traffic control. Because she was now in a position of responsibility, the state conditioned her. After conditioning, her ambition was not for herself alone, but for the good of the state. The conditioning was routine, and, Corbell gathered from later data, it didn't quite take. If she advanced the state's ambitions by guiding the courses of spacecraft within the solar system, certainly she advanced herself, and she came to the attention of a powerful man in the collateral branch of the bureaucracy, sub-dictator Cory Bessel Jakunk, Corbell heard his name often enough to memorize it, was not her direct superior, but he could do her some good. So powerful a man was allowed some leeway for his personal desires, that he might serve the state more readily. The old woman saw nothing wrong in this. She was impatient when Corbell did not understand at once. It may have formed a spur to her own ambition. His personal desire was merely Lyra Zilashishthar. He told me that I must be his mistress, she said. I wished more stature for myself than that. I refused. He told me that if I would share his life for a four-day period, he would gain for me a position in full charge of the Bureau, I was only thirty-six years old. It was a fine chance. She played him as she had played other men. It was a mistake. Corbell had wondered why he was being made captive audience to an unsolicited soap opera. He began to find out. Three million years later, at what looked to be eighty or ninety years old, she was still wondering what had gone wrong. The first night I used a chemical to help, to make one want sex. An aphrodisiac. It went into the computer memory. I needed it. The second night he would not let me use chemicals. He used none himself. I had a bad time, but I did not complain then or on the third night. On the fourth day he begged me to change my mind, give up my position, become his woman. I held him to his promise. For seven months she was head of the Bureau of Intrasystem Traffic Control. She was then informed that she had volunteered for a special mission, a glorious opportunity to serve the state. It was known that there was a hypermass, a black hole, at the center of the galaxy. 
Merely Lyra was to investigate it. After some preliminary use of automated probes, she was to determine, by experiment, whether, as theory predicted, such a black hole could be used for time travel. If possible, she was to return to her starting date. Why did he do it? she wondered. I saw him once before I left. He said that he could not bear to have me in the same universe if I was not his. But this was not what he offered at all. He may have thought, said Corbell, that four days of ecstasy would do it. You'd throw yourself into his arms and beg not to be sent away. For a moment he feared she would use the cane. Then she broke into dry, cackling laughter. He saw something likable reflected there, before her face drooped in brooding hate. Now she looked like death itself, the Norn. He sent me to the black hole. I saw the end of everything. Keep right. So did I. Exit right. She didn't believe him. At her urging, he described it as best he could. The colors, Exit the progressive right. flattening of core suns into an accretion disk, the swelling of the ring of fire, the final drastically flattened plane of neutronium flecked with smaller black holes. I only went in as far as the ergosphere, he said, and that was only to get me home fast. Did you really go through the singularity? Right. And she was long right. in answering. No, I was afraid. When the time came, I did not think I owed the state that much. Turn right. Her conditioning had worn off to that extent, at least. She had circled the black hole, using its mass to bend her course back on itself, and headed for home. She was eighty years old, still healthy and still beautiful, she said, due to the rejuvenation medicines in her ship's dispensary when she reached First Hope. He checked the times with her. Did her Bussard ramjet accelerate at one gravity all the way? Yes, twenty-one years each way. Her ship was far superior to Corbell's Don Juan and looked it. It was a toroid, bigger than Don Juan, and with a cleaner design. First Hope was a colony just being established around another star when Mirrily Lyra left Seoul. She hoped that First Hope would not have records of her defection. First Hope fired on her. What she had first thought was a message laser carried no modulation at all. It was an X-ray laser, designed to kill. She tried again. The next system resembled First Hope. It held a world of Earth's mass and Earth's approximate temperature range, whose reducing atmosphere had been seeded when the state was still young. Perhaps it had been colonized in the 70,000 years she had been gone. And it had been. She was fired on, and she fled. I was bitter, Corbell. I thought it was because of me, because of what I had done. All the worlds would have my record. There was no hope for me. I went to Soul System to die there. She had already recognized stars in Sol's projected vicinity. At Sol, she was not fired on, but the sun was expanding toward Red Giant status, and Earth was missing. Bewildered, she investigated further. She recognized Saturn and Mercury, heavily scarred by mining, just as she had left it, and Venus, showing the signs of an unsuccessful attempt to terraform that useless world. Get ready to turn Uranus was in a wildly altered orbit between Saturn and Jupiter if that was Uranus. Mars bore a tremendous scar, a fresh mare probably left by the impact of Deimos. The state was going to move Deimos, she told Corbell. It was too close. Something must have happened. She found Earth orbiting just inside the orbit of Mars. Corbell asked, Any idea how they did that? No. Deimos was to be moved by fusion bombs successfully exploded in one crater, Moving an inhabited planet could not be done that way. Or who did it? I never learned. I landed my ship and was arrested at once, on my record, by children. Children? Yes. I was in a bad position, she told Corbell, smiling wanly. Even at the last, when I landed on Earth itself, it may be that I hoped my beauty would sway a judge. But how could I sway children? But what happened? Earth was ruled by children, twenty billion children, aged from eleven years to enormous. It was young forever that did it. The state had discovered an ideal form of young forever, the old woman said. Parents can see to it that their children stop growing older at an age just below, what is your word, 
when girls begin their cycle of blood? Puberty. Just before puberty, they are stopped. They live nearly forever. There is no resultant rise in numbers, because these children do not have children. The method was far better than the older method of staying young forever. Older method? Of immortality? Tell me about that one. Suddenly she was enraged. I could not find out. I learned only that it was for the few, for the dictator class alone. When I arrived, it was no longer used. My lawyer knew about it. He would not discuss it. What happened to the solar system? he asked. I was not told. He laughed and desisted when she raised the cane. So the state hadn't let her play tourist either. She let the cane's tip fall. They told me nothing. I was treated as one not entitled to ask questions. All that I learned, I learned from my lawyer, who seemed a twelve-year-old boy and would not tell his true age. They learned my crime from my ship's log. They sentenced me to... Untranslated. What was that? They stopped time for me. There was a building where some criminals went to be stored against need. The bitter smile again. I was to be flattered. Only unusual breakers of the law were thought to be of future need to the state. People of high intelligence, or with good genes, or interesting tales to tell to future historians. The building would hold perhaps ten thousand, no more. I was lucky they let me keep my medicines. At that I could only choose as much as I could carry. She leaned close above the waterbed. Never mind this. Corbel, I want you to know that there was an earlier form of immortality. If we find it, we can Go both straight. be young again. I'm ready, said Corbel. He pulled at the soft bindings on his wrist. I'm on your side. I'd love to be young again. So why not untie me? It can't be this easy. We may search a long time. I have already searched for a long time. I must have your youth drugs, Corbel. They may not be as good as the dictator's immortality, but they must be better than mine. Oh. He had to answer. They're aboard ship in orbit. They can't help you anyway. You're probably older than I am, not counting the time I gained in cold sleep. He felt discomfort from the sweat pooled under him. He felt more sweat starting. He felt his helplessness. He saw her raise the cane. She waited until he had stopped thrashing before she said, I understand you. You come from a time earlier than mine. Your medicines are more primitive than mine. I cannot use them, so you say. It's true. Listen, I was born before men landed on the Earth's moon. When the cancer in my belly started eating me alive, I had myself frozen. There was... Frozen? She didn't believe him. Frozen, yes. There was the chance that medical science would find a way to heal the cancer, and the damage done by broken cell walls, and... His defense ended in a howl. She held the cane on him for a long time. He heard, Open your eyes. He didn't want to. I'll use the cane. His eyes were clenched like fists, his face a snarl of agony. A frozen man is a preserved corpse. You won't lie again, will you? He shook his head. His eyes were still closed. Now he remembered what Pirsa had told him about phospholipids in the glia around brain nerves. They froze at negative 70 degrees Fahrenheit, and that was the end of the nerves. He'd been committing suicide. And why not? But he'd never, never convinced the Norn. Let me speak this right, said Mirali Lyra Zilashishthar. I won't tell you about the first time I was taken from the zero-time jail. The second time happened because the zero-time generator had used up its power source. More than a thousand of us came suddenly into a world that was baked and without life. The weather was hot enough to kill. It killed most of us. The rain came down like floods of bathwater, but without rain we would all have died. Many of us reached this place, where days are six years long and nights are six years long, but life is still possible. I was old. I didn't want to die. Resigned, he opened his eyes. What happened to the others? The boys captured them. I don't know what happened after. I escaped. Boys? Don't be distracted. For many years I used my time only to stay alive. 
I searched for the dictator immortality, but I never found it, and I grew old. I was half lucky. I found a small zero time, a storage space for records in the forms of tape and of chemical memory, and for gene-tailored seeds. At first I kept my medicines in it. Later I emptied it out to make a zero-time jail just for myself. Straight on. Then I altered the subway system to take any passenger from the hot places directly to me. I made warning yeah. systems to free me from zero-time when the subway system was in use. Do you understand why I did all of this? My only hope was the advanced medicines that must be carried by any long-range explorer. One day, an explorer would come back from another galaxy or from one of our satellite galaxies. He would know no better than to land in places of Earth Straight that are on. too hot. He would need to come to the polar places immediately. She stood above him like a great bird of prey. The subway system would send him to me, carrying the medicines developed in my future that will let me grow young when my own medicines have only let me stay old. Corbell, you are that man. Look at me, she shrugged. You may be a thousand years old, or ten thousand. What you must know is this. If you are what you say, you are useless to me. I will kill you. Why? But he believed her. She said, We are the last of the state. We are the last of people. Those who remain are not people anymore. If we could grow young, we could breed and raise more people. But if you do not have the medicines, of what use are you? He heard her try to soften her voice. Consider, you are too old for even your advanced medicines to affect you. I am different. Give me back my health, and I will search out the real immortality that the dictator class used. You are old and frail. You will rest while I search. All right he said. The old woman was a Norn, right enough. She was both life and death to him now. My medicines are in orbit. I'll take you to my landing craft. I'll have to contact my ship's computer. She nodded. She raised the cane, and he flinched. If you break your word, you will take your own life when I let you. 3. When she was safely on the other Get side of the headboard, right. Corbell let himself relax. An almost silent sigh of released tension, followed by a wolfish grin and an turn urge to right. whoop, savagely repressed. At last, Corbell had set himself a goal. He had come down to die on Earth, but this was better. His hands came free. He sat up, but she gestured him back with the cane. She made him put his wrists together and bound them before she freed his ankles. The cloth stuck to his wrists like bandages. He didn't think he could pull loose. The bedroom's picture windows had stretched before they broke. The edges were like lines of daggers curved outward. He followed merrily Lyra, stepping carefully through the daggers, into knee-high grass. She gestured him ahead of her, toward a bubble car like those he had found in one city. Where his feet fell, big insects fled, whirring. It was even hotter outside but at least there was a breath of breeze. The sun sat on the horizon, huge and red, casting long, blurred shadows, a hard-to-see red circle on the red sky, smaller than the sun, must be Jupiter. The car seemed to rest on the very tips of the grass blades. It did not shift as Corbell climbed in. Merely Lyra gestured to him to slide over, with the cane, the cane that was anesthetic, and instrument of torture, and what else? He was afraid to learn, and climbed in beside him. She bent to the console, hesitated, then punched numbers. We go for your pressure turn suit, left. said the translator at her belt. The car moved smoothly away. Merely Lyra half relaxed. She was not steering. Already Corbell knew that he could not return by car. He didn't know the destination number of the house. Down the hill and into a narrow valley the car drove, accelerating. Now they were moving at hellish speed. Corbell gripped a padded bar on the dashboard and wished he dared close his eyes. She was studying him. You did not use such cars? No. Inspiration made him say, We didn't have such things on Dogpatch. She nodded. The knot in Corbell's belly eased open. God help him if she came to believe that he had left Soul System ahead of her. He had to convince her that he came from her own future. 
but there must have been inventions he would know nothing about, things humanity would not have forgotten. Like what? A bathtub designed to fit human beings? A cold cure? A permanently sharp razor blade? Or a treatment to stop the beard growing at all? Keep left a hangover cure that works? Left. If only I'd read more science fiction. Well, coming from another planet gives me some leeway. Turn left. I really thought I was the first man to reach the galactic core, he said. Your trip wasn't even in the records. How old are you? About 600, he said offhandedly. Our years. In Earth years, that's about... Don't get tricky. Count on her not knowing much about the Earth she Keep came back left. to. 530. How about you? Nearly 200. My years, not Jupiter years. I'm surprised you never ran out of medicines. It's all over. The children let me take my supply with me into zero time. I keep them there so they will not spoil. A thrill ran up Corbell's neck. She'd keep the food there, too, cooking it in large batches and then stopping time for it. That way her meals would always be freshly cooked. And that private jail of hers must be very close to one of the phone booth termini. What was your son? she asked. The only son he could even spell was Sirius. I never heard it called anything but the sun, he said. Just how much did you learn about the real immortality, the one the dictators used? Only that. When a dictator died, it was through violence, she scowled. Such events were remembered. My lawyer told me stories of one dictator warring on another, of war spreading to their families. Old stories from far before his time. From the sound of it, the dictators no longer served the state, even then, only themselves. Like Greek gods, he said. He heard the gap. Merely Lyra's box had not translated his remark. Powerful and quarrelsome, he amplified. Mortals did well to bow when the gods passed, and otherwise try not to get caught in the wheels. He glimpsed details of scenery as they flashed past green and brown hills, groves of dwarf trees. He looked for birds, but saw none. They went over a sharp crest, and Corbell's stomach dropped away. The car sped down toward what even Pearson would have called a city. It showed black outlined in red, with the red sun almost behind it. There had been a geodesic dome. A piece of the frame, a dozen linked hexagons, lacy thin, still stood along one city border. But the city itself retained the dome shape. In the center of a polar coordinate grid of streets sat an enormous cube with bulging sides, the transportation nexus. Spires and glass slabs sloped away from it. The tips of the tallest buildings defined the shape of the lost dome. A tall glass slab near the center had fallen against the great cube, where, bent in the middle, it leaned for support like a drunk against a large friend. Otherwise, this city, Four City, was almost undamaged. One city had been largely ruins. Perhaps Four City was younger than One City. Perhaps its dome had protected it from the elements longer. Green dwarf forest and green and gold grassland. The vegetation ran downslope to surround the city on three sides. It stopped sharply at a nearly straight borderline that ran past the city's far edge. Beyond that line, a five to ten mile width of barren borderland stretched to meet the bright blue of ocean. Strange, Corbell thought. Then it came to him that Four City must have been built before the world grew hot and the oceans receded. It was that old, anyway. But something else was strange about Four City. It had not spread out along the shore. What must once have been a curved line of beach was bare of buildings. No roads joined it to the city. Corbell, peering, made out regularly spaced black dots that might have been phone booths. He asked, Do you know this city well? Play tour director. Where is your private jail, Murali Lyra? She said, Yes. He dropped it. From here we go to the west coast of... I know. My machines watched your landing. He had almost grown used to the car's reckless speed but when they swooped into the city, his composure self-destructed. The streets had teeth, big chunks of fallen masonry, jagged sheets of glass. The car swerved around them, tilted forty-five degrees and more to take corners, 
straightened and tilted again, while Corbell strangled the padded bar. The Norn studied him with shrewd old eyes. You're badly frightened. I wonder what your people used for transport. Phone booths, he said at random. For long-distance travel we used dirigibles, lighter than aircraft. You traveled so slowly. Sweating, he said. We weren't in a hurry. We lived a long time. For an instant he considered telling her the truth. Get it over with. Her deal could work for him. They would use her medicines to make him young. Young Corbell would search out the dictator's immortality, while frail old Mirali Lyra waited it out in a rocking chair. It made good sense. But Mirali Lyra was crazy. The car swerved violently, ducking under something huge and solid. Corbell looked back. Embedded in the street, like a titan's spear, was a girder of Z-shaped cross-section. It was as long as the average four-city skyscraper was tall. The car slowed and eased to a stop beneath the great rectangular face of an office building. Corbell let his death grip relax. The old woman was prodding him with the cane, gesturing him out. He got out. She followed. The design of windows on the face of the building was not rectangular. The panes, largely missing, were laid out like a pattern in stained glass, and there were curlicues above the great glass doors. Corbell, still shaking in the aftermath of terror, pulled himself together. He needed to remember these. They might be an address. Two commas crossed, an S reversed, an hourglass on its side and pushed inward from the ends, and a crooked pie. Two sets of doors dropped into the floor to let them through, then slid back up. Mirali Lyra took them through a lobby padded in cloud rug, then through a corridor lined with handleless doors. The lifting boxes don't work, she explained. They climbed stairs, three flights, with pauses to rest. They were both panting when Mirali Lyra turned down a hallway. Corbell's fingers worked steadily at a button on his undersuit. He'd been wearing it since Don Juan took off. He'd washed it several hundred times. He twisted and twisted at the button. One thick, flexible thread joined it to the fabric. It would have to part all at once. More doors without handles. Mirali Lyra stopped beside the sixth door. She pressed something in her hand against the center of the door. As the door swung open, she put the unseen thing back in a pocket and gestured. Corbell passed through ahead of her. He dropped the button as his fingers brushed the jam. It was the first big risk he'd taken. He had no choice. He had to be able to re-enter this place. Mirali Lyra kept her eyes on Corbell as the door closed behind her. It closed on the button, and she didn't notice. Corbell was looking around him, everywhere but at the door. Desk covered with widgetry, cloud rug, phone booth, picture window. The offices were mass-produced, too. There were minor differences. The phone booth door was transparent. The picture window was intact and rain had not ruined the desk or the rug. Corbell's pressure suit and helmet had been dumped on the desk. He picked up the helmet in his bound hands. He called, Piercer, this is Corbell for himself calling Piercer for the state. There was no answer. Piercer, please answer. This is Corbell calling Piercer and Don Juan. Nothing, not a whisper, and merely Lyra was watching. My ship may be around the other side of the planet, he told her. But Pierce has set up relays. Or the autopilot may still be holding an equatorial orbit. But he wasn't. He'd changed it. Where was Pierce? Then he remembered. Merely Lyra had altered the subway system. Wherever Corbell had come out, wherever he was now, it wasn't where Pierce had aimed his instruments. As far as Pierce was concerned... Corbell had never emerged from the subway system. I will wait until I am sure you are dead, Pierce had said. Then I will search other systems for the state. He would have to bluff. If he's still in equatorial orbit, we'll have to call for my landing craft. He had to explain equatorial orbits to her by drawing in the dust on the desk. Then she understood. She said, We must use the tunnel cars. Take your pressure suit. Mine is in the terminal. The phone booth was too small. Merrily Lyra clearly did not trust Corbell that close to her. 
She held him covered while she drew a symbol in the dust, the crooked pie. Push this key four times, she said. Then wait for me. You cannot outrun my cane. He nodded. She watched him through the door. He paused to note that four of the eight symbols on the keyboard matched the four he'd seen over the entrance. He pushed the crooked pie four times. Zap! He was elsewhere. The world beyond the door snapped into another shape. Vast, empty space. Rings of couches humping from the floor. Here was another intercontinental subway terminal. Corbell fumbled in the belt pouch of his pressure suit, found a circle shape. His hands were trembling violently. Clear plastic disc. Right. With both hands, he guided it into the coin slot. He stabbed at the compressed hourglass symbol. Four, 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 four. Nothing at all happened. The phone booth in the Four City Police Station must be out of order. Merely Lyra Zilashishthar stepped into view from another booth and looked about her, eyes narrowed and jaw thrust forward. She saw him, still in the booth with the door closed. He jabbed frantically at the crossed commas. Remorse, terror, guilt, death wish flashed in his brain and were gone. And so was the light. In blackness, he rammed his shoulder against the door and ran blindly out into corridors, corridors with pale green walls and glowing white ceilings, wide doors with no knobs, only small plates of golden metal that might have been electromagnetic key plates. He turned right, left, right, and stopped, face to a wall, sucking air. Fatigue soaked into his legs like an acid solvent. Would she know how to trace his call? He couldn't know. He ran. A bigger door at the end of the corridor dropped open to reveal stairs. One long flight ran diagonally between a sheer wall and the tinted glass mosaic face of the building, with doors at landings along the flight. He froze in fear. If she was out there, she'd see him. Then he remembered. They'd passed a building with this pattern on its face. From the outside, it was a mirror. He was, he counted, three stories up. He still didn't know what kind of place this was, but it must be some kind of public service facility. All right. By the time she got here, if she ran as he'd been running, the old lady would be exhausted. She'd want to go down. So did he, and she'd guessed that. He went up. At the fourth story, the door dropped for him, then closed as he passed it. He climbed another flight, then looked back and saw footprints in the dust. He stopped, resting, listening. No sound. He walked backward down the stairs, stepping in his own footprints as best he could. When the fourth floor door dropped, he threw his helmet through, then his pressure suit. Then he jumped for it. He had left a pair of sloppy footprints, but no other tracks and now he was on cloud carpet. He stooped to brush away two dusty footprints, picked up his suit and helmet, and staggered on. He couldn't seem to get enough air.